to fail at system level, the probability of a uh, system level failure. So in order to do that, we need to know reliability of individual components. And also we should understand statistical dependence between component failure events. And also sometime we should consider uh, cascading effects like uh, progressive collapse. So actually I wrote some chapter or review paper about this topic, but today actually I'll just mention what this system reliability is about. So based on this, my research interest, actually I came to propose this uh, framework of system reliability based disaster resilience. Actually, as you can see, I got some insight from uh, this physics class I had long time ago. So with this ball, actually, I'm talking about some infrastructure system. But actually, this one is at the kind of edge of the cliff. And also, there's a, some hazard, variety of hazard on it. And the with the reliability, actually, we can talk about the ability of these components to avoid the uh, disruption, even, even though we have a hazard. So that's the red block over there. And then, uh, but we, we cannot have an infinite reliability because uh, we cannot afford it. So uh, there is gonna be some damage or failure, but even so, actually we wanna have some ability called the redundancy so that it's not going to you know, progress toward uh, even uh, further damage or system level degradation. That's a blue block uh, named the redundancy. And then finally, this with these uh, yellow uh, arrows, actually I like to describe this, the third criteria, which is uh, recoverability. So our ability to recover uh, our infrastructure system uh, rapidly and completely. So uh, roughly speaking, uh, reliability is kind of ability of uh, individual components. And the redundancy is our system level capability. And recoverability is the uh, ability of our, our engineers and society to do the proper actions on the components to recover systems functionality quickly and completely. So actually, let me just use this one real event to illustrate these three criteria I prom I'm proposing. Um, in 2015, uh, in December 2015, actually, this most exterior cable on this Sohae Grand Bridge in Korea uh, caught fire induced by lightning. And then actually it was so high and 80 meter above the deck level, so it took three and a half hours to extinguish it. So uh, during this uh, long time, uh, this fire actually moved to the other two. So actually the, we eventually had uh, one complete uh, rupture of the cable and then two more uh, cables were partially ruptured. And then unfortunately one firefighter uh, passed away. But actually, uh, since this is a very important bridge, like uh, in average 42,000 vehicles are passing. So actually we are worried about this indirect loss so actually we had to uh, shut down the traffic completely, uh, but in the beginning we thought it's going to be a month to recover, but actually they were able to reopen it two weeks earlier than that. So with this event, I can explain these three criteria one more time. First, uh, reliability. Uh, actually these cables did not have uh, enough reliability to the fire uh, induced by lightning because if they did not have a fire resistant materials or lightning rods, and also they did not have a capability or facility to extinguish this fire quickly. But actually we did not have a progressive failure in our system. It means uh, this structural system had uh, enough redundancy. But the reason why they had to shut down the traffic was that uh, they were not sure if this system is gonna be okay under normal everyday traffic. So uh, they plan to uh, replace these three cables for a month, but they were able to uh, complete the task in 16 days. So I believe this is kind of a champion case or story uh, I'm proud of as a Korean engineer. So uh, actually we had uh, enough resources, including human resources like uh, experts and engineers and uh, if we find element models and rapidity uh, to have uh, to recover this one quickly. So uh, beta pi analysis and beta, beta pi diagram. So 
this is very nice framework, but uh, actually in order to do the analysis, we should introduce some index and also method to calculate them. So first index I introduced was uh, reliability index, uh, denoted by Greek letter beta. So uh, sorry for this uh, math, but this is probability of certain initial disruption scenario, like a cable three and five and 10 fail together, okay? So if you can compute that probability of the failure, the initial disruption scenario, you can translate it to this reliability index, okay? Next, given that damage, now we are gonna do reliability analysis again to find out probability of a system failure. So in this simple example, the system failure is defined as separation of these two, two parts. So after we introduce this damage in the describing the initial disruption scenario, we perform system reliability analysis to compute this probability, and that will be translated to this redundancy. So we named it pi after this Greek word pleonasmos, meaning redundancy. So then uh, to facilitate our analysis, uh, we actually try to put this result into the so-called uh, beta pi diagram. So y-axis is uh, reliability, x-axis is redundancy. So for each initial disruption scenario, we have a pair of beta and pi. So then we are gonna have as many markers as the initial disruption scenario we consider or investigate, okay? So then uh, here, I don't have enough time to explain these probability terms, but what we want to check is that whether uh, the system failure probability caused by that initial disruption scenario is socially acceptable or not, okay? So if your marker is in this red area, uh, we, we have a socially unacceptable risk for that corresponding initial disruption scenario. So the moment you identify this uh, marker inside this area, you try to make some decision like a retrofit or reinforcement to move this marker outside. So we thought that this beta pi diagram is gonna be helpful to identify these initial disruption scenarios and do something about it. So because of time limit, actually I'm gonna just skip this illustrative example but as you can see, for this trust structure, even though we have a two uh, reinforcement plan with the same number of uh, members, depending on which member you retrofit, actually you are going to have a different result in this beta pi uh, uh, diagram. So then uh, I'm gonna show you this example to wrap up this uh, presentation. So again, this is a Sohe Grand Bridge. This time it's kind of different kind of fire initiated by this tank truck in an accident. And suppose uh, this fire is going to induce the uh, huge heat here, then actually the strength of these cables will be reduced and the thermal expansion will be introduced to your structure. And also if any cable is failed, the load is gonna be redistributed and your system is gonna be totally different one. So this is indeed a very complex hazard for a critical infrastructure system. So as for this probabilistic analysis, we first study this fire hazard and then set up this kind of probabilistic model. And then we understood the relationship between different random factors. And then this uh, heat, uh, heat flux is applied to final element model of this Sohe Grand Bridge. And then we performed advanced final element simulation to find out which cable is going to fail. So here uh, we introduce this reliability index to represent the ability to avoid cables initial failure. And also we define redundancy index as ability to avoid the cascading failure among these uh, cables. Uh, to, do, to perform this analysis at the component level and system level, uh, we had to use this kind of state-of-the-art uh, reliability method called uh, AKMCS. So here I'm going to skip the detail, but using this method, we computed the beta and pi for each cable. So you are seeing the beta pi diagram of this uh, Sohe Grand Bridge. 
And this one is actually the reliability of each cable. The second figure is the redundancy of each figure. And these results are combined to this beta pi diagram. And then we found that these cables in this uh, light blue area do not have enough resilience. So we have some socially unacceptable risk here. And uh, we investigate these cases in detail and found that this is due to uh, low redundancy, relatively low redundancy of this cable uh, because of these angles of these cables to the uh, bridge. Uh, actually, the more cables are subjected to this cable fire and heat. So actually, it means that you should put some walls there to protect this cable or the wrap this cable uh, to reduce this uh, redundancy, uh, increase the redundancy, I'm sorry. So I'm going to summarize today's talk. So um, to uh, understand and also estimate, uh, evaluate the resilience of our infrastructure system, I propose a system reliability-based disaster resilience framework highlighted by these three criteria, reliability, redundancy, and recoverability. And I use the I use the Sohe Grand Bridge example to explain what these three criteria. And then actually I apply this method to a uh, cable bridge under fire hazard. And then using this uh, beta pi diagram, we were able to identify the cables the showing the low re uh, resilience for which we should do something. And actually now uh, we are trying to automate this decision making process by uh, developing this optimization algorithm. And also we are applying the same framework and method to a bigger system called infrastructure networks as well. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I would be happy to answer any question if you send me emails. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tong. Uh, I'm a little bit afraid that we don't have time to make Q&A, so uh, why don't you keep in touch with him uh, personally? All right, let me move to the next presentation. The second presentation uh, title will be Optimal Identification and Safety Assessment of Bridge Structures Based on Long-Term Monitoring Data and will be presented by Professor Yu Chi Tong from National, National Taipei, Taipei University of Technology, Technology. Uh, CICH. He is, uh, as you uh, uh, know, uh, he is currently president of CISE. So could you start, president? Okay, I would like to uh, give my thanks uh, to the invitation uh, from uh, by uh, uh, ASEC and uh, TC recently. And uh, it's a great uh, pleasure for me uh, to have the uh, um, presentation title Optimal Identification and the Safety Assessment of Bridge Structures Based on Long-Term Monitoring Data. Uh, as, uh, just like the human beings, um, the structural performance of the existing bridges uh, may, de uh, may decrease uh, from time to time. Um, due to maybe an aging problem or the um, um, uh, um, design standard, okay? So um, how to uh, make the uh, uh, safety assessment is very important. So now we propose a, a process um, to um, uh, 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 achieve the target. The first step uh, we think about, uh, sorry. The first step we think about is um, may, uh, maybe the loading test that can be conducted on the existing bridge or the new design bridge to um, have its uh, structural uh, response and to find a relationship between the loading and uh, as input and the uh, response as output, may, then we can uh, optimize our byline model by uh, some approach of optimization uh, algorithm. And here uh, where we will introduce, uh, we use um, box vector designs and the response service function to optimize our byline uh, model. And as long as uh, the model has uh, been established, then we can use uh, the long-term monitoring data. Um, and uh, through the uh, response service function, we can rapidly give uh, the response of the structure due to um, any uh, possible uh, loadings. And then the threshold value of bridge management can be established. And eventually we can have the uh, purpose of a safety assessment. And 
I, will, I would like to show you a real case um, related to uh, pre-stressed country uh, bus builder um, with co uh, corrugated steel webs, which is uh, located in Taichung, Taiwan. Uh, as you can see, conventional um, pre-stressed concrete bus girder, uh, its web is uh, made of uh, concrete. However, because uh, its uh, self-way is so large, so a uh, smart way is to use uh, the uh, uh, corrugated steel webs to replace it. By this way, the earthquake force will be decreased, and uh, a better shear performance of the steel web uh, would, would give a, a, big, a better performance to the um, bridge. So it is um, um, well uh, adapted. And we also used uh, some um, monitoring uh, instrument um, by Simbali um, expression, for example, uh, uh, strain gauge and uh, LVDP at both um, side of expansion joint, and inclinometer and uh, thermometer, and so on. So this um, sensor will give um, this um, important um, um, signal for our analysis. So now the first step we have to uh, um, establish the final element model, and then we um, conducted force vibration and a steady loading test. And if, if possible, we also apply the dynamic loading uh, experiment to um, the um, um, bridge and to um, observe uh, the um, um, data, the structural response. And then based on the um, uh, relationship between the I and O, then we can um, uh, make the optimization of uh, the uh, model. And then for the long-term um, monitoring data, and we can uh, feed feedback to the um, optimized model to uh, fulfill the purpose of diagnosis of damage condition. Eventually, we can give the um, threshold value for structural management. This is our case that, uh, 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 sorry, I will get go back. The case that we consider is a four continuous span of PC uh, box builder. So uh, now we will pay our attention on pier 40 and pier 41. So for this case, uh, we just um, uh, implement uh, the uh, sh um, uh, shaker on the uh, middle span of the, between the P40 and P41. And we apply a sinusoidal uh, excitation force. And through the frequency domain analysis, we can have the um, corresponding um, frequency corresponding to first mode, second mode, and third mode. And they, um, their uh, frequent corresponding values um, are listed here. And then we also uh, consider um, the steady loading test. Here we list the four uh, cases we uh, applied. As you can see now, um, the first case uh, we applied uh, one half loading, one half uh, the, the truck loading over the one half span between P40 and P41. And this is the second one, this is the third one, this is um, the last one. So there are um, four cases of a steady loading we conducted. Those two um, um, photos uh, were conducted at that time. And we use a uh, laser measurement to um, make the observation of the uh, displacement. So as you can see now, we are uh, um, focused on this point, this point. So for different kind of loading tests, we can have different uh, value of the displacement. Okay, so now, because we have uh, conducted the um, force, uh, forcing uh, vibration and a steady loading test, so we can capture the uh, frequency corresponding to first, second, and third mode. And we have also um, uh, four different uh, uh, kinds of uh, results of um, displacement for case four to case seven. So we have, we have seven targets to achieve. So now we establish the final element model. So as you can see, because uh, the tendon was implemented inside the box builder, so we have to consider the tendon to, uh, to make the simulation. And also the thickness of the web um, changed from 30 meter to 22 meters. So um, this kind of variation is also considered in our model. And uh, we also use uh, the side element to simulate the concrete slab, okay? So the total element we uh, consider for the side element for country is um, 158,000. And as for steel web is uh, uh, 50,000, and PR is uh, 131. 
So you can see uh, it is very, uh, oh, sorry, it is very detailed simulation in our model. Okay, this um, process that we uh, propose um, is um, the main core of the structural analysis we consider is um, to use uh, the Midas civil. And now we um, make the uh, post processor by considering, uh, sorry, sorry, by considering um, a bus beacon designs and then we uh, use uh, the hybrid uh, genetic algorithm to do the optimization. As you can see, this column means um, the genetic alg algorithm and uh, in which the mutation was um, performed by a particle swarm optimization um, named uh, PSO. So we use um, a PSO to make the mutation and eventually we use uh, the simulated annealing SA to um, consider um, if um, the uh, gene change is um, needed or not. And we uh, repeat the process until it is um, uh, conver uh, it, it converges. And eventually we can have the optimal model. Okay, so now we uh, just uh, consider um, the random um, distribution of um, Young's module of the steel. Of course, it is based on assumption, okay? So we just uh, use um, the um, normalization method to uh, use uh, unity indicate the Young's module this value and uh, negative one this value. And also we use um, S sub phi for a weight per volume. So now the design variable we consider about uh, uh, concludes five items, S1 to S5. Now we uh, use uh, the response service method. So this is all the consideration that should be taken into account. And I will uh, illustri illustrate it uh, one by one later on. So now if we, if we met prime error for all the design variable, the cases we need is about 243. So, so many, it is impossible for us to do this kind of a finite element model. So by bus bacon test, only 46 test points are needed. So you can see that the computer uh, consumed will be decreased uh, significantly. So now we consider the input parameters including S1 to S5. And through the finite element uh, analysis, we can have the output corresponding to model one, model two, model three, and uh, the displacement corresponding to four cases. And then we propose to uh, use uh, the response service um, uh, method. And this slide shows the response service function we consider. We um, use a second order polynomial for model one, model two, model three, and so on. And uh, uh, through the investigation of significance of parameters, um, we consider, uh, you can see that the um, um, items can be decreased. For example, for the model one, originally is 21st, 21st, and then um, we only consider 15 is enough. So the analysis process can be shortened. So now our objective function is that uh, we want to, okay, we want to let our uh, finite element analysis result, the difference between the uh, finite element analysis result and the test result, and that should be uh, reached the least. Of course, the penalty function we consider is like, uh, show, uh, shown uh, in this equation, okay. So because uh, we uh, use uh, PSO, SA, and NGA, um, AI-based uh, consideration to do the optimization, so this is all the parameter, uh, sorry, this is all the parameter, parameters we consider. And then, uh, during our analysis, uh, uh, it's about uh, 211 generation um, to converge and it's a corresponding fitness is, is this value. So eventually we can see that the result we got for the Young's modules for the steel by design variable S1 to S4 is almost the same, which is a very uh, reasonable for the steel structure. And then the final um, the um, um, weight per, um, uh, per volume, S5 is this value. So this is our uh, final result. And through the final result, and also we can see uh, the uh, response, uh, uh, um, response service function. As you can see, our res analysis result, the R square is um, very close to unity. So it means that our precision uh, is very good. Okay. So eventually we just made a comparison 
and through the uh, optimized structure uh, model, uh, we can have the analysis result, which is have a, agree, a good agreement with uh, the experimental result. So it means that the optimized um, um, the structural model we can have. And then, according to the ot optimized model we have, then we just uh, use uh, the long-term monitoring data as input uh, to, the, uh, and to, to, to the model. And actually, this figure shows um, the uh, temperature gradient um, between uh, those um, of four um, thermometers during one year. So you can see maybe here is a uh, um, summer, here is a winter, okay? So we just uh, consider uh, this um, data of, of uh, the um, temperature gradient as the input and to uh, perform the structural analysis of our optimized model. And then we just take, take a look at the um, de uh, deformation at uh, the LVDT O1 and O2. So you can see this figure shows two um, diagrams. The red one means uh, the actual measure of data, and the uh, uh, dash one means um, the um, final element analysis result. So you can see we have a good agreement between those two results. And the bottom one is the result for LVDT O2. So it means that the um, structural model we, uh, we have is very reliable. And also we can have uh, the um, 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 rotation at the TH3 and uh, T, uh, T uh, not, uh, sorry, not here and here, so some point here, okay? So you can see also uh, each figure com uh, each figure shows two um, diagrams. The uh, black one means um, the actual data we, we have. The red one means um, the analy analysis result we got. So you can see that those, the difference between those two results are very close. So according to the, um, 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 uh, based on our research result, then we can do the um, safety assessment. And then uh, eventually we can um, um, serve it as a bridge management. So we have to uh, establish uh, the um, um, warning uh, threshold and the critical threshold, okay? Uh, in which uh, the warning threshold can be um, um, expressed by this equation. It means that we can use, consider the allowable stress of the material and minus um, the um, stress uh, currently, then this is um, the sigma um, uh, uh, sub-warning, okay? And on the other hand, for the critical case, we can consider the optimal stress um, to um, minus um, the um, current stress. So by this, um, um, uh, this kind of uh, um, threshold values, we can establish for um, each inclinometer se uh, sensor on site. So because you can see we implement so many of uh, inclinometer here. So for each for each one, we establish the threshold value. So we can take a look at the um, um, measure data from time to time. Once as long as um, the signal exceed the threshold value, our system will submit the message to the uh, uh, to to the manager. So we can we can do a, a good uh, bridging management, and all the materials I mentioned today. Um, if you are interesting, yeah, you can make a reference um, about this paper. And the second author, um, Professor uh, Lin Zigang, is also at the city here. So if you have any uh, question, you can um, send the mails to me or to him. Okay, no problem. Okay, here comes my conclusion. This study implemented a bridge uh, monitoring system consisting in situ monitoring and optimized numerical model. The initial state of the uh, bridge are determined, uh, was determined using in situ experiments serving as the database for optimized optimization. And the second one is uh, monitoring data were collected from May 23rd, 2012 to May uh, 23rd, 2013 at that interval of um, um, 10 minutes. So the data were incorporated uh, into the numerical model and, and analysis was conducted with the consideration of the temperature gradient along the depth of the beam. And the third one is that um, the observation points of global LVDT and local inclinometers indicated that the numerical model can effect, uh, effectively, effectively 
reflect the physical response of the bridge under the thermal effect. And finally, we can say, th say that the warning and the critical threshold value for the composite bridge were determined by the monitoring data from the internal meter and results of the finite analysis, enabling effective judgment concerning the safety assessment of the bridge in the opening, in up, uh, operating phase. And this slide gives uh, the total conclusion that uh, uh, we establish, establish uh, optimized uh, finite model um, to give a good, uh, re um, predict a rela rela good relationship between uh, input and output. And as you know that uh, for the monitoring um, um, system, if we got uh, the sensor from remote sensor and back to the, our platform, we have to make a decision as soon as possible. So it is not impossible to use the finite analysis again because it needs computer time. So we just use the concept of response service uh, method to replace the compli uh, complicated finite model. So by this way, as you can see, originally the uh, analysis time may be, um, uh, the unit is may, may be days. However, now by uh, RSF or RSM, the unit is only second. So this is why we consider, um, we use um, the RSM to do the structural monitoring and uh, the uh, safety assessment for region management. That's all my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tang. And uh, next talk will be done by myself. Next presentation, please. Okay, this, yes. uh, my name is Ho Kyung Kim, again, and uh, I would like to talk about the risk-based uh, traffic operation on crossing bridges on the strong wheel. So, uh, uh, we built more than uh, 90 bridges at this moment, and we experienced some of the rollover accidents on crossing bridges. Uh, so I would like to talk about a couple of uh, samples today. So uh, the first one is uh, Gwangwon Bridge. So we experienced a couple of uh, a lot of accidents in 1912, uh, and uh, both accidents were done uh, in one hour uh, duration. So we experienced uh, both accidents, uh, one hour uh, separations. And next one is Seoul Grand Bridge. So we experienced a couple of rollover accidents over the bridge. So I would like to talk about the cause of the accident and uh, risk assessment. So the Gwangwon Bridge, let's take a look at the Gwangwon Bridge here. So uh, the bridge consists of main spans and approaching spans. And then uh, the accident were uh, observed in the approaching spans. So it was very curious at the time because that the height of the main span, the bridge deck, elevation is higher than uh, the approaching spans. That means wind speed was uh, higher uh, on the main spans, but Actually, we experienced an uh, accident on the approaching spans. So uh, to find out the cause, main cause, we have to take a look at the bridge carefully. So this is main spans, and main span, uh, the bridge deck, uh, double deck, is e was uh, equipped with uh, stiffening truss members uh, between upper deck and lower deck. Uh, how about the uh, approaching spans? Uh, due to the very narrow span, uh, we don't need a stiffening truss. So uh, we, we cannot find out a stiffening truss between upper and lower deck. 
so uh, due to f uh, to find out the uh, load effect on the bridge deck, we uh, perform the wind tunnel test, and then uh, we have to uh, build uh, the bridge section models to find out the actual effect on the uh, vehicle load. So we perform wind tunnel test with vehicle models inside, and then we look. Uh, develop the spatial jig inside so we can rotate the bridge deck motion, uh, bridge decks inside the wind tunnel to check uh, the variation of uh, the variation of uh, wind induced load, three forces and th uh, three moments for the uh, different wind uh, in incident angle of the wind. So, uh, for the rolling moment and side forces, uh, we obtain the variation of uh, co uh, load coefficients for the upper deck and here lower deck. So as you can see here, the side force and uh, rolling moment increase a lot uh, for the uh, on the lower deck here. So this is due to the so-called tunneling effect uh, between upper and lower deck. So uh, closed uh, sections and then wind speed becomes higher uh, of the lower deck. So uh, now we uh, we already uh, measure the wind load effects uh, on the bridge deck. So we, we can pop, oh, we can perform the estimation of critical wind speed. So we try to find out the accident criteria or uh, some instability in, uh, instance of the vehicle. So we consider uh, two accident criteria. One is overturning accident and the other one is uh, side slips. So uh, to find out this criteria, we need uh, contact force of the tire. So we have to perform vehicle analysis. Uh, we uh, determine uh, wind load coefficient over the vehicles. So uh, if we perform the vehicle analysis, we can obtain uh, the wind speed that can uh, occur uh, some rollover accident or side slip accident uh, of the vehicle. So for each wind speed, uh, uh, wind directions, we uh, perform the vehicle analysis and then try to find out the minimum wind speed that they can, uh, they can occur the vehicle accident. So here, you can see uh, this point, the minimum wind speed, that will be the critical wind speed for the bridge on the, uh, on the specific uh, spot of the bridge. So this is uh, the wind speed is a kind of random property. So uh, the wind speed is fluctuating all the time. So. Uh, we need some kind of probabilistic approaches to determine uh, the accident. So we use uh, the uh, non-existing probability of 5% for our analysis. So uh, we perform the vehicle analysis and try to find out critical wind speed uh, for the bridge spot. So, uh, if we just assume we allow vehicle speed uh, by 80 km per hour, and then we uh, apply the analysis and then find out the critical wind speed for each spot along the bridges. So as you can see here, this spot and this spot approaching span, we can find out the lowest, uh, uh, lowest traffic control wind speed. That means uh, if we to not close the bridge, then we can experience a kind of big accident here. So uh, we understand low deck is very vulnerable spots and then uh, wind speed is not that high, uh, around 15 meter per sec. And how about if we uh, decrease the 
driving speed of the vehicle, uh, then the vulnerability will decrease. So uh, by uh, use the uh, maximum uh, vehicle speed, we limit the maximum vehicle speed by 40 kilometer per hour, then we can increase the uh, traffic control wind speed by two or three meters per sec. So uh, this is one of the ideas to keep the risk index. And the, uh, eventually we propose this kind of protocols to bridge operators. So uh, the level two wind speed increase to seven uh, 17 um, meter per sec, then we recommend uh, to close uh, the bridges uh, on the lower deck uh, for the high-sided vehicles. And then if, we, if the wind speed increased over 20 meter per sec, then we recommend to close uh, the high-sided vehicles even for the upper deck. And close all the bridge uh, all the bridges uh, over the 28 meter per sec and this is a uh, traffic control in the speed and uh, actually the risk index is uh, also the function of the wind environment so we uh, collect uh, the probability density function of wind speed for each wind directions like this and then uh, with the information we already obtained combined together, then we can calculate uh, the risk index in terms of the expected accident frequency for one year. Uh, the inverse of this uh, risk index uh, denotes that the return period of that those kind of accidents. So our Korean guidelines uh, admit our return period of 20 years uh, for this kind of accident. So let me talk about uh, more about the remedy. So uh, the other, we can control the vehicle speed, but more efficiently, we can apply the wind screen on curved direction only, so very limited ranges. And then uh, the, uh, the wind forces on the vehicle become smaller uh, due to the wind screen. So by applying these uh, remedies, uh, we, we can realize that the risk index can be come to the allowed range. So that is one sample. And one more uh, things we have to do, uh, consider will be the uh, roughness coefficient in rapor uh, conditions. So, uh, bridge uh, is open to the uh, natural hazards. So, uh, okay. So, uh, we tried to measure the roughness coefficient of the deck uh, in raining uh, conditions. So. Uh, we can see that dry conditions, the roughness coefficients uh, uh, over 0.8%, uh, 0.8, but it decreased to 0.6 in raining conditions. So uh, if we consider this kind of uh, uh, hazardous conditions, then we realize that we, we have to decrease the critical wind speed uh, with uh, rainfall or icing conditions. So there is another challenge issues in operation of the bridges. Next one is soil bridge case. So as you can see here, yeah. uh, all the vehicles yes, stop. They already <laughs> feel that uh, the vehicle is very unstable to the side wind. And eventually one truck overturned and then uh, this one was also done in uh, approaching spans. So uh, let's take a look at the overall geometry of the bridges. So this is table state bridges, main spans and approach spans. And uh, for these approach spans, we have one rest area. Uh, 
uh, for this uh, highway bridge. And then uh, to entering this rest area, so we widen uh, the overall bridge width. So there is very abrupt transition uh, spot uh, along the bridge. So that was the one of the uh, reason to experience those kind of uh, accident. So to find out the reason, so we uh, developed the wind, uh, wind tunnel section models and uh, by changing the position of the vehicles, we uh, measure the wind induced load. And we eventually find that uh, very specific uh, wind directions and we, we find out this area was uh, the side force and rolling moment increased very high. So that was the uh, main region of the road of accident. So probably we need some kind of a wind screen over here. Okay. So uh, this is a final uh, pay slide for my presentation. So we developed some framework to determine uh, risk index of the uh, overturning accidents uh, numerically, and then try to, to support uh, bridge operators to optimize their uh, strategy. So we try to help uh, decision making considering trade off between mobility and safety of the uh, drivers. So we are currently develop some related uh, research. Okay, thank you for your kind attention. So uh, I understand we have uh, around 10 uh, attendants uh, in uh, online. So uh, next one will be uh, done uh, by online. So the title will be Effect of Side Surface Opening on Torsional Plot Instability of a Rectangular Cylinder by uh, the group of Yokohama National University. And this uh, presentation is co-authored by Professor Hiroshi uh, Katsushi and Jiaki Wang and will be uh, presented by Ms. Kwam Kim Vientok. Are you ready, Miss Miss Tok? Could you start? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you see so my slide? Can you see my slide? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you for your confirmation. Uh, Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tok. Now I'm studying in uh, Yokohama National University in Japan. Uh, it's my pleasure to share with you about my uh, research effect of a size of its opening on dozono flutter instability of a rectangular cylinder. Uh, recently, a new type of sport girder with a size of its opening called the butterfly web girder has been applied in many bridges. Uh, with the advantage of the weight reduction of structure and uh, easy maintenance. Since the size of its opening can change the wind flow field around the girder, therefore it is necessary to investigate the effect of the opening on the aerodynamic instability. And this is a Tacoma risk, an example of the grid that uh, was broken down due to the dosono fluster instability. There was a previous study about research on the uh, effects of the opening on the dosonal cluster for a girder with the size so B and D5. B is the width of the girder and D is the height of the girder. This is the uh, result of the dosonal vibration test for a closed box girder and a, a box girder with the size of its opening. As we can see, uh, the amplitude of vortex induced vibration decrease and the 
critical velocity of those no fluster increase. This indicates that the opening can stabilize the those no fluster. However, the research also uh, still like uh, many uh, investigation investigation on the relationship between the size shape of the size of its opening and those no fluster. And therefore, my uh, uh, the objective of my research is to investigate the effect of the size of its opening on those no fluster and uh, investigate the effect of the size of it opening on the flow field around the girder. In my research, the winter notice was conducted to uh, uh, survey the behavior of the girder. And uh, this is the model of the girder. This is the cross section of the girder. And uh, to decide the size of its opening, there are two parameters. The first one is the opening area ratio, OR. And the second one is the repeating element size ratio, RER. The opening area ratio OR is the ratio between the opening and the uh, frontal surface area. The RER is the ratio between uh, an element including one opening and one plate to the uh, inner high space. And the experiment K in my research, uh, including two group of RER and the uh, OR chaining from zero to one. To find out the error by which we part of the structure, the, uh, the free vibration test of the single degree of freedom doesn't know motion was conducted. And the free vibration test was conducted uh, under the smooth flow and the angle of a test is uh, zero degree. The angle of a test is the angle between the wind direction and the uh, horizontal axis of the um, girder of the girder bridge. And uh, this table is for the characteristic parameter for the free vibration test. Now I would like to introduce the reason of the aerodynamic report. As we can see when the OR increase, the amplitude of a vortex induced vibration degree and the critical velocity of those no fluster increase. This means that the, uh, the structure became more stable when the opening increased. Another point is uh, for the same OR case, the girder with the larger RER uh, 3.29 uh, is more stable than the girder with the smaller RER 1.316. Uh, this is shown clearly for the OR 0.5 case. Um, as you can see here, uh, the, red, uh, the red line is for the girder with the larger RER. Uh, the, the, the girder is total stable, but for the girder with smaller RER, the amplitude continue increase uh, when the velocity increase. Uh, it means that the, the girder is still not stable. And the next one is the, uh, another parameter to evaluate, evaluate the chain of the girder stabilization is the aerodynamic derivative A2 star. Uh, at the wind velocity of the water in the version and the high wind velocity, uh, the aerodynamic derivative degree with the increase of OR. For the OR, uh, and the next one is for the OR point, uh, 0 0.5 case, the A2 star for the girder with larger RER 3.29 uh, is e total negative. But for the girder with smaller RER, the A2 star continued to increase and uh, it became positive when the wind velocity increased. This confirmed again that the girder with larger RER is more stable than the girder with the smaller RER. And this is the end for the aerodynamic response reason. Now I would like to introduce the effects of the opening on the flow field around the girder. The flow field around the girder was measured by the PIV test. Uh, 
and uh, this is the PEIB test setup for the measurement, the flow field around the girder. And this table um, are the parameter for the measurement and uh, wind velocity analysis. And this is the result for the time of this flow field around the girder. This number, uh, this blue number shows the height from the girder surface to the time average separated shear layer. Mm, as you can see, uh, with the increase of OR, uh, the high, the high degree uh, gradually decrease, and uh, for the case girder uh, total opening OR equal one, uh, the uh, just the the time every uh, separated shear layer distance uh, appear. To confirm again, this is a uh, potential reason for the opening stabilizer aerodynamic stability. And this is conclusion from my research. The amplitude of the vortex uh, induced vibration degree and the critical velocity of total flutter increase with the increase of OR. As the wind velocity of water induced vibration and uh, high wind velocity, the aerodynamic derivative are uh, a to star degree with the increase of OR. And um, for the same OR case, the larger the girder with the larger R E R. Um, 3.29 can uh, stabilize the water in duration and doesn't no flutter than the girder with smaller IR uh, 1.316. And the last one, um, the enlarging the OR can uh, promote the time of separated shear layer to approach the girder surface. The reattachment point of the separated shear layer on the surface uh, move to the upstream side. It is a potential reason for the opening to stabilize the dozen of fluster. And this is all about my uh, research. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Ms. Todd. And uh, let's move to the final presentation. Uh, this will be done by um, Mr. Anton Chowdhury from Canada. And uh, actually, uh, is surprised. I was surprised that um, we are we have a uh, time difference with twelve hours. So uh, this is quite midnight in Canada, but he is still in uh, is still online. So Ansan, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your strong. Uh, participation uh, to our uh, technical session. Let me introduce uh, your presentation. The title is Elemental Element Level Risk-Based Inspection Framework and Development of a Bridge Information Model and Management System. So uh, Mr. Anton Chowdhury is working Halifax Harbor Bridge. He is field engineer, and he is uh, one of the teach members in ASC. So, uh, Ansan, could you start? Yes, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and good morning from Halifax, Canada. Before I go to my presentation, I would like to show you where I am now. So, I'm in Halifax, Canada, which is 10,000 kilometers far from Seoul. Somehow, if I get a direct flight, it will take 17 hours from Halifax to see you. So you understand where I am. And it's, it's, it's early in the morning, and I know that this is uh, uh, 4 p.m. almost there. So Halifax Harbor Bridge Commission has been established in 1950 by the province of Nova Scotia. And first bridge was built in 1955 and opened to traffic, which is, you can see in the bottom, which is McDonald Bridge, and after 15 years, we built another bridge, which is called Amure Mackey Bridge. Both are a uh, suspension bridge. So you understand that McDonald is almost 68 years old and Mackey is more than 50 years old now. 
So one of the thing I really like from uh, Federal Highway uh, Bridge Authority, uh, Federal Highway Authority uh, developed a life cycle condition uh, of a bridge that shows that how over the age of the bridge, its condition goes down from good to severe. And based on this life cycle curve, actually they are showing that there are three different maintenance uh, or asset management you need to uh, develop and and deliver. You can see that from zero to almost 40 years, we call it preventive or preservative maintenance cycle, which is mainly cyclic maintenance or you know condition-based maintenance operation that you need to deliver. The second phase is rehabilitation, that many of the component is not in a position to repair. You have to replace or you need to do a lot of we have during this life, which is starting from 35 goes until like 42, 45. Then at the last cycle of a, of a life of a bridge, we call it replacement phase. When you know that the bridge will not remain uh, in service soon. So at that time, you need to make a decision what needs to be done uh, with a minimum investment to keep the bridge to end of its service life. So one of the thing I want to, uh, emphasize here, as you understand that each and every phase will have a transition from one to another. So that transition time, what you can see here from 35 to 40, this is very important for the owner to understand that you are moving from one direction to another direction. And if you do not take actions, what is needed at that time, it will impact the life cycle of, of your bridge. So, Based on that, we actually develop our asset management plan. As you understand, as I said, that my two bridges are more than 50 years old, means I'm in the last stage of my uh, asset management plan for, for these two bridges. One of the problem we have that there are many inspection and maintenance manual is available in the world but you do not find any specific inspection and maintenance manual that talk about long span cable supported bridges. So we developed our own element level risk based inspection framework. Why? Because as I say that each and every bridge has its three different life cycle for maintenance and inspection point of view, but each and every inspection, every maintenance cycle, one of the thing is very common, which is inspection. You need to know when you will do inspection in a timely manner to identify the problem that needs to address or you need to implement a mitigation measure. So what we have done uh, in 2019 to 20, we developed our own element level risk-based inspection framework. What actually we get from this new inspection framework is that which element needs to inspect it in which time and identify the condition that I can develop my effective asset management plan. The way we do it, that we have a general risk framework, then we need to find out what is the occurrence factor, then consequence factor. Once I know what is the occurrence factor and the consequence factor, that can give me a risk-based inspection frequency. It means that, you know, generally, most of the bridge owner operate their inspection program in a specific frequency. Someone do this thing every year. Someone does this thing every two years and detailed inspection is done after five years. But during this one year or two year or five years, there are some components may need closer attention. It means that you need to go and check it more frequent than one year maybe every month or every six months. So how we will know this thing? This is the mathematical approach we took to identify what elements condition is severe or in a, in a condition that we need to enhance or increase our inspection frequency. Not only that, having this all this information, we can actually calculate the bridge condition index over year and year that will give you an idea that how we are doing our maintenance program. So this is the mathematical uh, formula we are using to identify the risk. How? First, we need to identify the inspection priority number, which actually directly relate to the inspection frequency. And the formula is the product of occurrence factor, 
and the coincidence factor. These two product multiplication will give you a inspection priority for each element. Another one you can calculate, which is the risk priority number for this specific element. To calculate the risk priority number, you need to know what is the global importance factor of that element. As you know, each element has two different influence factor. One is local influence, another is global influence factor. So if you know the global influence factor, and somehow if you can calculate what is the weighted average defect index, then you can get the risk priority number for that specific element. So calculate the weighted average defect index. We use a formula which is called maximum condition rating. You can see here, it's, 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 it's a little bit complicated. I will not go and detail, but you first need to find out what is the maximum uh, defect index. Then you can calculate the weighted average defect index, which will give you the uh, in inspection, sorry, uh, repair priority number. So another one thing you need to understand, which is the occur we develop a occurrence rating. What is occurrence rating? This is something that we are assuming that if a condition of a bridge element is excellent, what is the likelihood that over five years it can be, it can lose their service ability? Based on that, we develop our occurrence rating for each and every element. What we are showing here, if any element is in excellent condition, that means that it is very remote uh, probability that it will go from uh, excellent to to out of service within five years. If it is good, the probability is low and fair, moderate, poor, high, and end of life definitely certain that it will go out of life within five years. So we developed a uh, occurrence rating. Then we need to find out, as I say, that you need to find out two things. One is occurrence factor, and another is the coincidence factor. To find out the occurrence factor, we are using this formula. You can see it here. I showed you that before, based on the inspection, we can calculate what is the weighted average defect index for that element. Another one thing you need to know, what is the probability that it can go from one stage to another stage. And we can find out these things if you can develop a deterioration model or a deterioration curve that we develop for each component based on steel or concrete condition. So this is the deterioration curve. This is a combination of a couple of things that we put together to come up with a uh, deterioration curve that is applicable for our situation. The red line that you show here, which is a kind of a step model that shows that zero to 20 years, it would be remain same as a condition rating one. And after 20 years, it will go to one to two, which was developed by Ontario. Structural inspection manual, which is mainly focused on highway bridges, not cable supported long span bridges. But as you understand that a condition of a bridge element cannot remain same within 10 to 20 years. So Markov, one of the researchers developed another curve, which you can see barely here is a blue curve, uh, model state that over time, how the condition of element of a bridge will deteriorate from one condition to another. So if we plot these things in one graph, you can see there is a transition between the Markov curve versus uh, OSIM curve or a step curve. And the transition point, if we connect all this transition curve uh, point, we can develop our own deterioration curve. That's the way we developed our own deterioration curve, which will give us the probability of changing a station that we need to find out our occurrence factor. So this actually shows that how we calculate our uh, occurrence factor from that deterioration curve. What you can see here, that if the condition is excellent, then there is a probability that 0.08% probability that it will go so bad within five, five years. If the condition is good, there is 4.3% probability that it will go from good to worse, And that's the way we, we count all this uh, probability from that deterioration curve to find out what is the occurrence factor for that element that can go wrong. So this is the condition uh, 
deterioration model for the concrete before that I showed you that was a condition card for the steel structure and this is for the concrete as you know that we have many concrete structure which is the foundation of a cable supported bridges so we need both deterioration car for for steel and and the concrete so from this we can calculate what is the probability of concrete element that can go from excellent to bad or all these things so we did calculate all this occurrence factor uh, probability of occurrence from that deterioration curve to find out what is the occurrence factor also as i said in the beginning that you need to know two things one is occurrence occurrence factor and second is what is the impact or consequence factor if that occurrence happened so this is the chart we are using which is based on your capacity versus demand ratio you can see in the horizontal way and the vertical bar actually show what is the global importance of that specific element which you can get from your structural engineer what is the global importance factor for that element so that actually shows if the capacity versus demand is one it means that capacity is just equal to the thing one and your global importance factor is like this you can find out what is your consequence factor here i will show you one example here so if I want to find out what is the occurrence factor based on the capacity versus demand ratio that I already calculated, and I know what is the uh, global importance factor for the tower, I can actually find out what is the consequence factor. This is the chart we are using. So based on the calculation, I know that capacity versus demand ratio for that tower is one. And global importance factor for the tower is more than 20. So our consequence factor here is one. So I already got my occurrence factor and the consequence factor. So now I can find out what is the inspection frequency that I need to implement for this tower. So this is the two information now I already have. Based on the uh, uh, occurrence factor, I got it is moderate. So it's here. And from the consequence factor, I got the consequence factor is one which is here so that shows every 48 month it means for every four years i need to do the main tower inspection but as you understand that in the past before 2021 each and every year we are inspecting our main tower for for condition assessment but based on the condition that we have now i actually do not need to go and check the main tower every year so these are the way we are actually defining what elements get the highest priority and need more frequent inspection than other elements. So as you know that some of the elements based on our calculation can fall under like this. If the consequence factor is four and the global occurrence factor is high, then definitely you need to do an inspection every six months. So I have 48 different elements based on this condition-based inspection framework. Now I know that 30 elements need to inspect over four years or two years, but some of the elements I need to inspect every six months. So it is way more scientific way to invest your resource and time to manage your bridges. So after we get all this information, if we can use all this formula, actually I can calculate the bridge condition, which is based on this calculation. I don't want to go all the details. It's, it's very much complicated calculation as you understand that here we are showing that the tower section from C4 to the tower, these are the element I have, which is main cable, hangar, deck, plate, stiffening truss, floor beam and trough. Each and every one has a local inference factor, global inference factor. I already know what is my IPN and RPN. Based on that, I can calculate the condition, sorry, condition uh, of the bridge or that element. Once I know the condition of each element, I can actually calculate the overall condition index of the bridge using this formula. So if you see the bridge condition index is 68% this year and next year it goes down to 60, then you know that you, you, are, you are not doing well. You need to do something else. And if the condition is index go high, it means that you are doing well or the condition of the element getting better by implementing maintenance and rehab options. So that was our inspection uh, framework that is mainly now based on risk.
Based on this inspection, what we do, we develop our bridge as asset management system, which is very easy model that you can see here. First, we need to understand what is the condition of each element and what is the risk based on the condition. Once you know the risk, you need to calculate what is the impact from a technical and financial point of view. Once you know that, you can develop your asset management plan. But the problem is, it's not a one-time calculation. Each and every year, when you do the inspection, maybe your condition can change and risk can be changed. So you have to do these things again and again. So each and every bridge owner should have an asset management plan, which is a living document, needs to be updated every year based on the inspection and condition of the steel, condition of your bridge element. Another one thing we have done that one of the biggest challenge we have, how to communicate all this information to the bridge engineers, our maintenance staff, and maybe to our board of director who actually make the decision and approve the budget. So we develop a very interactive uh, bridge information model and management system. And I will show you quickly how we have developed that thing. So we actually uh, scan the whole bridge uh, with thousand station. It's a real scanner, not like a drone inspection or drone scan. We actually have thousand uh, different station that we use a LIDAR to scan each and every component of the bridge. And one of the service provider has the software to stitch all these small pieces to build this point cloud model. So by having this scanner, now I have a point cloud model for one of my bridge, which is McDonald Bridge, you can see here. And the precision level for this point cloud model is very close to 0 0.001. So now you can actually go and take a measurement anywhere and you can get a precision level from 0 0.001 millimeter range. Not only that, after we develop or get this point cloud model, we also use our as-built drawing to develop a CAD model. This is a CAD model, but this CAD model has been calibrated with the point cloud model, which is the actual real condition. Once we have this 3D rabbit or CAD model, we put in a software to develop a database. So now we have a 3D model with the asset management database that anyone can go and click any component that will give you all the information. What is the as built drawing condition rating that I was showing just before? What is the demand versus capacity ratio? Any digital inspection survey, photo, work order, you can find any information about that specific element for just a one or two click. Not only that, this model is georeferenced. So if I ask or want to issue a work order that I need to inspect a specific component and my maintenance team needs to uh, remove the paint so I can go and do the inspection, I can issue a work order here and they can use their iPhone or a smart phone and click to say that I want to go there. So it will work like a GPS and they can go there without having any drawing or anything. Not only that, if the bridge inspector go there and do an inspection and upload this uh, inspection findings to the specific element, it will upload it to the system and our bridge engineer will get a notification that a new inspection has been done. So it's very interactive that anyone can see what is the condition of the bridge. Not only that, our board of director, if they want, what is the bearing condition of the McDonald bridge, they can click on the bearings and it will show three different colors yellow, red, and green. Green means it's very good condition. Red means it's due for replacement. Yellow means it's under, under, under monitoring system. So having this very interactive bridge information model and management system, now it is very easy for us, like bridge engineers and the decision maker to make a decision how to do the inspection and how we are managing our bridges. That's all for today. Thank you very much. If you have any question, I would love to give you some answer. Thank you, Mr. Chowdhury. Uh, thank you for your very energetic and insightful presentation. Uh, due to the time restraint, uh, I'm afraid we cannot have q &A, and I will uh, uh, keep in touch with you through your email. Thank you. If there is any question, feel free to send me an email. I'll, I'll try my best, best to get back to you. Okay. Right. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Okay. So time already uh, done. So.
Uh, before closing uh, this session, I would like to uh, ask you to come forward to make a photo together to before closing our session. Thank you for your kind attention.